Welcome to everybody and joining us for the next hour, Marcus Samuelson, author of The Black Cooks and the Soul of American Food, The Rise. This is our third time hosting Marcus at Live Talks Los Angeles. It's great to have you back on our stage, Marcus. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me and uh, always nice to be back. This is the strangest time because I'm not back in the traditional sense, but you know, we're gonna make it work. We are gonna make it work. And, and if there's anything uh, that is wonderful about food is in, in difficult times, food has a way of bringing us together. So uh, the occasion uh, is great. The circumstances for your next book will hopefully be different. Uh, Marcus, let's start. Um, um, how, how is the restaurant? How are you coping in the pandemic? Um, this is by far the toughest time. I mean, I've cooked all my life, uh, worked in restaurants all my life and gone through a tough time before, whether that's been 9-11 or the economic downturn, nothing, nothing can compare to this. And um, what I'm afraid of is that black, brown, BIPOC communities, their restaurant scene, their hospitality scene is gonna be gone, not just for this year or next year, but as a whole generation. And that will transform those neighborhoods, our neighborhoods very, very differently because once the mom and pop restaurants are gone, uh, that means that that lovely barbershop, that coffee shop, that favorite beer hall that you like is also gone. So restaurants is really the heart and soul of our neighborhoods. And I've never been as worried as now. You know, Marcus, I've um, I've always thought of, of, of Red Rooster as you know, it's not just a, a restaurant, uh, you know, it, it could be located anywhere, but there is a, just a unique sense of place in, in, yeah. in how it lo you located it in Harlem. And um, tell me about, about, you know, the sense of community around the restaurant, pre-pandemic and also how that has energized the neighborhood now. Yeah. I mean, pre-pandemic, Red Rooster was the home of, is the home for 180 staff plus 70 musicians. And when we planned the restaurants, the five, six years before I opened, was to really show all the expressions of African-American culture, art, food, music, and neighborhood, right? As a character, as a part of, the, of this. And um, so it takes a lot of people, it takes 250 people push and pull to create this but we also have an audience of 4,500 customers coming every week to support that. Um, during the pandemic, we had to shift quickly. March 15, we closed the restaurant, as you know it, to become a community kitchen and to serve a different audience. And we, we were more deep tissue, but not as layered as an experience. We had to serve a line of about 500 to 1,500 people a day. And uh, we have to learn about social distancing and it took a lot of pride in serving a community that are also Harlemite, but that we didn't serve before. The by far the neediest. Um, and we learned a lot what it meant to be, what it means to be a restaurant in a neighborhood like Harlem. Tell me something, uh, Marcus, you um, were born in Ethiopia. You went to Sweden at a very young age and then uh, you came to the US. Um, so, um, how Swedish are you, how Ethiopian are you, and how American are you? Wow. Well, that's a great question. It's something that, you know, I think the year of 2020 is the year where we all ask ourselves questions about race, identity, and culture, right? We see it in the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we see it in, um, the deepest barrel of that, how the, the outgoing uh, administration have pulled people against each other and, and always gone for the, for the lowest and the, in mankind. But it's a, it's, a, it's a question that I constantly have asked myself, but I feel like this, the luxury of having three incredible windows into cultures and people gives you empathy and understanding not only do I know how it is to be African, I know very specifically how it feels to be Ethiopian. I feel the same about being European, but specifically about being Swedish, right? You know, when you take the term American, it's very big, but I do feel 
I know a lot about being New Yorker and even local, more locally, Harlemite. And those gives, just like you have, many different windows in Ethiopia, Palestine, and the West Coast of LA. Those gives you specific windows and, and we learn how to code switch. We learn how to be very local with the conversation. And sometimes we work on the macro. Um, and this is something that I talk to my son about, my wife about, my fellow cooks about in the kitchen. And um, it's a privilege to have windows into three very distinct different cultures. You know, another window I, I'd like us to visit for a second before we dive into the book at length, uh, Marcus, is that window um, that presented itself to you when you first uh, uh, joined a New York uh, restaurant. I want you to compare that moment to the moment when you open your own restaurant. Um, describe sort of the simil similarities, the differences, what those feelings were like. Well, I think as a creative, you gotta always give your best. And different stages in your life have for me equally energy, but they, you take different ways away from it. Working at Aquavit was my window in to become, to get a green card, but not only get a green card, also to understand New York, learn how to deal with the fish purveyors. Why did I always get the last delivery? And then I learned how to get the first delivery. Um, understanding operations, a uh, difference between Europe and America. I feel like I went to restaurant school at Aquavit in Midtown. I learned um, so many different things that I then, Red Rooster wouldn't have been Red Rooster without my experience at Aqua V. Um, but it was also clear to me what I didn't want to do. Just like when I was in Europe and I saw there was never people of color and there was never women in the kitchen. What did I take away from that? Was that when I get a chance to hire, I'm going to do um, a much more multicultural, multigender kitchen. Same thing when I was in Midtown, I also knew what I didn't want to do which was only cooked for the 1% of the 1%. I did not just want to be a special occasion restaurant. I didn't want to create an us and them scenario. I wanted to create, create a community restaurant. So the stakes were the same. It's just, would you take away from it? And that for me is part of the evolving. You know, I had to evolve as a chef to do that leap from Midtown to Harlem. And, um, I think that's what life is about. Live a full life with different rich experiences. You're going to take different things away from, and you're going to give different things towards. So the clearly a book um, as complex and as rich as this doesn't come together um, very quickly. And um, yeah, I don't know that you could have anticipated the racial issues that arose in our country um, earlier this year. Uh, but tell us, walk us through what it took to pull this book together. Where did the idea come from? I mean, now it's, it's more important than ever, but I, I'm curious who your partners were in this and, and how you, you pulled together all these fascinating chefs in this book. So the work, my books take four years to make, right? And I would say even five, because there's a year where I'm thinking, is this a book or is this an article? Is this a book or is it a menu item? I, I'm thinking about stuff in my head and I go to my lab, which is my kitchen and I cook dishes. I test it on people. And is it just an article? And just an article, by the way, it's a, it, if that's the expression, that's the expression, you know? But I, I, I knew that this was a book because most of it wasn't my story to tell. And one of the beautiful thing about being black and having an audience to talk to is that you get a chance to explain all the layers and the complexity around blackness. And it's highly complex, but what the rise really talks about is authorship, creating memories and creating aspirations. So with the authorship, it meant we have to learn where the food came from and we have to give credit to the people that were there and gave to American food scene and they never got the credit for it, right? 
in terms of memories, just like we've done with music, we created great memories around music. Therefore, it's a happy place for us with black music. And if we can create same memories around black food, there's another entry level into race and culture that we can have that is much lighter and more delicious. And in terms of the aspiration part, if we don't create an equal worth of what it means to aspire to be a chef and why there's a worth to be in this field, you can't aspire the brightest people to come to a space. Like I'm going to give you an example. Um, Nearest Green is the, is the person who created the recipe for Jack Daniels. He never got one dime for it. So the aspirations to his family and extended family was so the aspiration and the value of brown liquor was zero. That is one of the most famous brown liquor brands in the world that he got zero dollar amount for. You know, and, and that's one example, right? So we have to understand the authorship and give credit where credit is due. We have to create memories that have many entry points. And then we have to create an aspiration platform so people want to come to it. And we've been able to do it with music. We've been able to do it with black culture in terms of sports. And now it's the time to do it with Black Excellence in terms of food. I want us to dive into some of the flavors um, um, and you, you address uh, flavors and spices of North Africa. Uh, tell us about some of those and, and the ones that, that, that fascinate you that you like to play with in the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, I, I find Northern Africa a fascinating place because um, between Egypt, Morocco, and Ethiopia, you have some of the oldest civilizations in the world, and those were trading markets. When I talk about the Dukkha spice blend that we use for our roasted beets, they've been in Egypt for 2,000 years. So the rituals of making kitfo in Ethiopia way before there were recipes, right? Those are tribal rituals that we are, we've had in our culture. So the rituals around African cooking is way older than the recipes of the West. Yet we have not yet, you have to look hard and deep to get credit for it. You know, most of the great food that we think about comes from Africa, wine, the art of making beer, um, chocolate. When we talk about it, we always refer it from a European lens, you know, Belgian chocolate. Although there's yet no Brussels, there's no, Cocoa beans to be found in Brussels. Love the beer in Brussels, but not necessarily the cocoa beans. You know, so we think about it, even for black people, it's confusing because all the great stuff that came from our continent has been reframed back to Europe. And we wouldn't do that with other European things. Therefore, even as a black person, you don't fundamentally understand your worth or your ancestors' worth. And that's an important part. Um, so I think re, the re-education, the miseducation about black cooking and, 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 and black cooking in America really has many layers to it, right? It can be, it came here from West Africa, right? To, to the South Carolinas where we have basically four cuisines that stems of American cooking that is linked with African-American experience. Low country, Creole, Southern food, what we refer to as soul food, and barbecue. Those are four original cuisines that comes out of America and the, out of the black experience of America. So as I said, black excellence, black food is America's food and now it's a time to give credit. There's uh, one, uh, one spice from Ethiopia that has become uh, fairly common now. Uh, it comes in little containers at Whole Foods. Uh, I've seen other chefs mention it, Barbare. Uh, tell us, tell us more about what exactly is Barbare. And, and there are different parts of Ethiopia, there are different types and flavorings, there's a regionality to it. Um, tell us what's so unique and interesting about it and how you incorporate it into uh, your menus. I love that, that you said that the final sign of arrival is that it's in Whole Food. And to one part of that, you, you're right. But you know, uh, I just, think about all the spice kings and queens at the Mercato in Ethiopia, they will have no clue about what Berbera is. 
The Berber is essentially a currency in Ethiopia. People know two things, three things really, in terms of pricing in Ethiopia. You always know the price of Tef, you know the price of Berber, and you know the price of dollar to bear, right? Those any house family would know these things. And when the market goes up, when the price goes up, so Berber, so, so that's actually how America used to be, right? People knew the price of sugar, people knew the price of salt. But we, you know, that economy is maybe 100 years ago, 150 years ago. But Berber is that bloodline in Ethiopia. And it's a, you know, dried chilies, dried garlic, dried cardamom, dried ginger. And when you go out in Ethiopia, you drive in the countryside, people have their chilies out on the roof or on outside their home. And of course it's terroir, so it's a little bit different where you get more sun and et cetera. But it's really, the it's our salt and pepper. It's what we really, it's our spice blend that we use for everything. And uh, yes, at places like Whole Food, but also where it will try it even more is in the airports, right? When wherever Ethiopian airlines flies to, Going from LA, New York, DC, there might be medicine, toothpaste, uh, dollars being sent to Ethiopia. Coming back, it's always Berbera coming back into those suitcases. <laughs> That's a little secret. Uh, you know, TEF has also, uh, is also becoming popular. I mean, I think some people are uncomfortable with injera, the, the bread we eat in Ethiopia. Um, but if I've been noticing it has begun to appear in recipes and uh, you know, I, I've seen F crackers and, and such, what do you attribute that to? And what, what is it? It's, it is a complex taste. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, but I think all brilliant things around the black experience, people are always uncomfortable with in the beginning, and then you realize it's brilliant, right? People were uncomfortable with Jimi Hendrix, Miles Davis, and Prince, and then realized that all those three things were things that we really needed. So if it goes that path, I'm fine with it. No, but obviously in Jera, the fermentation process gives you this sour taste, which is a very, very important part because that's how we fermented and how we kept our fresh bread fresh when way before we didn't have refrigerators, right? But it's always in that sourness. You know, a tef, an injera is very similar to me, like an Indian dosa. Uh, you cook it on one side and it bubbles up. But yes, it is that sourness that can have people, uh, you know, it could be off putting for some. But I, I th I've always found Americans very curious about food. The very open, poorest country when it comes to food and music, uh, in terms of its curiosity, especially around the big cities, but also in a, in mid-sized cities as well. So, you know, Tef has also is gluten-free, right? And it can be used in many different aspects of cooking. You can make pasta with Tef. You can make, of course, other breads with Tef. Uh, so yeah, I think it will be very become just grow and be more and more popular in America. Someone, uh, you know, cooking, uh, you know, let's say someone is not terribly experienced or even someone who, who is experienced. What's your advice on how close to a recipe one should ad adhere or, you know, how much ad-libbing do you recommend? Well, I mean, I think it's all based on your comfort zone in cooking, right? If you're an avid cook, use it as a guideline. If you're not cooking a lot, I would step closer to it, right? I mean, the most biggest challenge for someone cooking out of something in the rice, first of all, the recipes are all doable. That was very important to me to make recipes that people can make. Um, but then also, I didn't want to apologize of bringing African words into it, like igusi seed, that is a, really the watermelon seed, right? Because, and I was a, that is this incredible Ethiopian, uh, basically vinaigrette that we use or uh, hot sauce that we use for so many different things because we learned so much from the immigrant culture of not, like kojijan in Korean culture, kimchi in Korean culture, difficult thing to spell, difficult thing to say, but I'm so happy that the Koreans were not, they didn't compromise on it and kept it. 
because we're better for it. You know, the Japanese, we taught, learned a lot about uni and nori and so on. So I think there is something to, let's get over this little hurdle of complexity in language. But once we're there, it's really liberating to be able to say, better, better, to be able to say, I was there. And, and then start using it on tacos or on roasted fish or on roasted carrots. Now we're cooking and that's how America, you know, really is at its best. This uh, recently we tried, uh, our first recipe out of the cookbook was uh, Stephen Satterfield's um, uh, Spice Roasted Cod. Nice. And, and what, what I, we liked about it is, you know, the part where it, it, it suggests some mix, a melange of herbs Mm -hmm. And and it didn't specify which ones. It just said your choice. It was sort of yeah. like chef, chef's choice. If you, if you like more rosemary, you put more more rosemary. And I I, I really like that. It sort of it, it felt like we had like we're given this license and this freedom to experiment. And it was a delicious uh, dish. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the various recipes in here, so in the process of uh, not everyone watching is familiar with how cookbooks come to be in the process of identifying, developing all of these recipes. Were all of these um, test kitchen in some capacity and tried out to, to make sure you're happy with them? Well, I mean, it, it, here's real how it came together. As Usaid, the writer with me, and Yawanda and I, we sat together. I, knew, I, I wanted to have a blend of telling my story and the cooks that work for me stories that are African-American or of African descent, but also beyond that, right? And because blackness cannot be explained, the most important point of the book is that we're not, black food is not monolithic, florethal. It can be directly from Africa like me, it could be from the Caribbean, it could be through the great migration. And those are all different aspects to it. So it was clear that we started to think about the, rest, the recipe from several different buckets. And this honor system where we wanted to highlight a chef, where we kind of, Eduardo Jordan is from, lives in Seattle, but he's really, his parents, and he grew up in Florida and he lives on the West Coast, right? So we did recipes around him that fit his restaurant style, but also his journey. Mishama Bailey, that did the reverse migration that came from New York down to uh, Savannah you know, she represents me what, what the reverse migration might look like. So it was a blend between verticals and telling stories about a layered complexity around blackness. It could be taste many different things. And then it was easier when it was a linear path, like the immigrant story, right? Greg Godet, he's Haitian American, grew up in Brooklyn, lives in Portland. That's an easier story to tell because that recipe will be around Haitian food. Eric Gastel worked 30 years at Le Bernardin, being Caribbean French, worked in Paris, married to a Japanese wife. His story is for me, that's how modern America looks like. Just like your story, having Ethiopian past and a Palestinian past, living in Los Angeles, right? So that for me only, that's the beauty of America. When we celebrate that, that's our most delicious space. Tell us more about Haitian food, um, uh, Marcus. Um, flavors. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell me more. Well, Haiti is such a, just like Ethiopia, it's such a strong space, place, you know, beat the French. Uh, we have a soup called soup jumoun, which is an independent, it's the soup where the Haitians celebrate at every major holiday. It's an independent soup, a pumpkin soup. But I just love this idea that on your biggest feast, you're eating a soup. That says something, you know, that, 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 that is something around that. But then you also have this mystique around pickles, for example, this very acidic and spicy pickle that Haitian puts on all food. And then you have this mystique which Haitian culture is very mystique to me. I always say Haiti is the closest things to Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a black rice called Dijon John, John John rice. And it gets blackened by this beautiful, almost like black trump trumpet mushrooms that are dried. So he has this 
incredible deliciousness and depth of flavors. This island, you know, the former Española island that has a, such a rich history. And yeah, it, it could seem that I hope more people taste because it's delicious. What about Creole, Creole flavors in cooking? Yeah, I mean, in, in Creole, you start to see the first fusion food, right? So Haiti is very much in that picture as well, but so is France and Spain, right? So you have this, uh, and of course, of Africa. So where, where Haitian food for me is more pure, Creole is a little bit more mixed, right? And that there lies the beauty. There are techniques that are 100% French mixed with African methods as well. And when you, when you, when you taste Creole dishes, like a gumbo, or like um, beignet or something like that, you really see how, how mixed of culture it is. So Marcus, what are, what are the must-have spices in your pantry? Well, berbere, you have to have berbere because it's a, it can give you so many different directions. But I love also, um, you know, in the book we talk about suya. Suya is this street food that comes from Northern Nigeria. Uh, from the, and it's, 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 really a, it's a, really a dish grilled skew beef skewers that you put the suya glaze on top. And when I eat it, I always think about Afro beets, I think about fella, um, and it's just a very happy space. I also think that this mission match, that's what America is so great at. Have some extra virgin olive oil, have some pumpkin seeds in there, maybe have a, an already uh, half made mole mix, right? So, you know, when I, one of my favorite places in Los Angeles, is Central Market, right? Mm -hmm. and right there, it's, 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 there is organic sounds there that I go and get my mole, I get my jar and like my plastic tub of mole. I go and get my um, pupusa from Guatemala or, or, or uh, um, El Salvador, or you know what I mean? Like it's the market, the sound of the market is telling me what to buy. I have a friend, Marcus, who, who tells me that uh, it, it troubles him that Americans are always inviting people over for a barbecue when what they really are doing is inviting people over for a, for a grilling. And that barbecue is so much more sophisticated. And uh, uh, is, <laughs> he goes, they don't know what they're talking about. So uh, let's talk about Rodney Scott, uh, who, who I, I just look at the picture on that page and it's just so salivating, you know. Um, What's the secret of barbecuing, Marcus? Listen, tell your friend that as bad as he thinks it is, or she thinks it is, Sweden and the rest of the world is worse. <laughs> because when they say we're gonna barbecue, they totally mean grilling as well. Um, and, and uh, you know, at least in America, we've tasted pure, a lot of us have tasted real barbecue. Well, Rodney is, is really Barishnikov of barbecuing. He, he, he's not only the best in the country, he's the best in the world. And it comes from his father. So, you know, Rodney, this is an art form, how he works with the wood. No, forget the meat, starts with the wood and heat. And then mopping it. So let, before even we get to the meat, like he's already like, the wood's gotta be right. The sound of the wood. The barbecue is an art form and it's a tradition that it's almost like jazz, right? Very few people can actually play it, but it's for everyone to enjoy. And even the word jazz get beaten up sometimes to, you know, that's not jazz, but it's kind of a metaphor for something that is, could be modern, could be old, could be this. And, but when you have had real barbecue, like in South Carolina with Rodney, or in Texas as well, you know you've had it. You're not gonna say, I don't remember if I ever had that. It's one of those experiences like, you know, if you're lucky enough to heard Miles or, you know, I'm fortunate enough to know Jason Moran, or like geniuses in jazz. You, you're gonna remember if you heard Jason or you met Jason. You're gonna remember if you had J uh, Rodney's food, I guarantee. And that's why 
you know, I'm so excited for him for this moment because more and more people start to understand barbecuing and grilling. And five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe that question would have been, people wouldn't have understand the difference between that question. Right. All right, let's spend some time. I, I mean, there's uh, fabulous chefs in the book um, and it seems unfair to just pick a few to talk about, but I'd like you to, to chat with us a little bit about a few people in the book. Nina Compton uh, mm -hmm. from New Orleans. Amazing. Well, Nina is a true in American story. Like she was born in St. Lucia, you know, and came to this country, started to learn real cooking with Danielle Boulou, worked in Miami, and now she walks in Miss Leah Chase's footsteps. And her and her husband own two restaurants in NOLA, and they navigating through it in a very, very tough time. But Nina is, like me, a restaurant worker, and she will be a restaurant worker for all her life. And um, she balanced New Orleans heritage with the three cuisines that that city has, also with her Caribbean influences. So I think she's perfect being in NOLA because they're open to good food always. And they're open enough to, to take her influences from the islands as well. She's amazing. Uh, Davida Davidson in Detroit. Well, Davida is for me what, first of all, when it comes to black food in America, we should pay the greatest gratitude to black women. So most of them are unknown, but they're really the, founding building blocks of American food. And a lot of them were activists, silent activists. And when you think about someone like Davida Davison, both brilliant, but she's also an activist. And even Leah Chase was an activist. To get the black vote in New Orleans, you have to go through Miss Leah. You know, Saphir Wright in, she was Lyndon B. Johnson's chef. He trusted her more than he liked the people in Congress. And she was a big influence of getting the black vote. Miss Georgina that woke up three o'clock in the morning and raised money for the civil rights movement in a club of nowhere. She baked cakes. She earned hundred dollars a week that she donated to the civil rights movement. A mother of six. I mean, just imagine what this, this is not, this is in the fifties. You have six kids, you're waking up three hours early just to bake, you, you're netting $100 extra a week and you're giving all that money away towards the movement, right? So, so Davida steps lineage is from that, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book for the young chefs, the Patricia Gonzalez, the Tiana G's. And like black women in America has been the backbone of American cuisine, whether we, those stories were told or not. Um, I'm biased. Uh, the, there's a Los Angeles connection. Naisha Arrington. And Naisha is everything, you know, like there's a moment in the book that gives me goosebumps is when Naisha talks to me about growing up in K-Town with her great grandmother, her Korean grandmother that just speaks to her and her sister in Korean. And, you know, we're, we're just about to learn about the complexity on a world stage that you can be both Asian American and African American and female and be a vice president of this country. Well, Naija is Asian American and African American and a brilliant chef. And it's through these stories, right? Like when I can, through her recipe, I can really hear her grandmother talk to her and obviously they land on food, you know? And, you know, Naisha is just, she's, She's such a force when it comes to cooking. And she's such a naturally gifted chef. And um, I'm just so happy that she's part of the book. Uh, Tony Tipton Martin. I would say this book would not happen without two ladies, Jessica B. Harris and Tony Tipton Martin. I mean, both their books are, for me, the fun. You know, I have certain chefs and I'm like, what is she doing? What is he doing? I got to know what they're doing. And with Jessica and Tony, it's the same thing. Like their book sets the standards and then everybody's like, it's like air boxing. You're trying to get to that level. <laughs> um, and I'm so happy that they've set the table for us so we can go in and evolve and, 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 and grow it and, and, and 
this would not happen without Tony's inspiration. It wouldn't happen without Miss Jessica Harris' inspiration. And then finally, the one I wanted to ask you about is Andre Houston Mack. Well, you know, it was important to not talk about just chefs. We're an industry that you have chefs, you have writers, you have winemakers, you have all of it. I mean, we're all in this, right? And we know we, we knew each other as black people in the industry, but the large mass didn't. And you know, when you read Andre's story of becoming a very significant Pinot Noir winemaker, I think you understand blackness. He started at McDonald's. He worked very, very hard and got to per se. And for a lot of people that would have been, you know, Mount Everest, but then he wanted to make wine. And what did he do? Because he didn't, he doesn't come from generational wealth or he didn't have an auntie or uncle to call. So he started a cold call wineries on the West Coast. I wanna, I wanna take your grapes, I wanna make wine. And you know, those are 99 cold calls, but one said yes. And that was the winery in Portland. And now he makes one of the best, you know, affordable and best Pinot Noirs in the country. And that story is so much the black American story. We will not give up. We will be entrepreneurial. Our past is ups and downs, but we'll get to the finish line. I've uh, wondered, uh, Marcus, let's fast forward to, we're all vaccinated and we've gotten over the pandemic. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> take me to that space. What, uh, any thoughts of maybe, you know, doing periodic residencies where some of these chefs come to New York and, and, and spend, you know, four or five days and you have, uh, you know, showcase their uh, food to via Red Rooster uh, or even through other restaurants to, to encourage other, other chefs to, to open their kitchen to bring in some of these talent. So, um, obviously the pandemic have put our path and plan upside down. And for me, it's very important to walk the line of ambition, but also be sensitive and sensible to this moment, right? But the idea is to create a residence program where two black chefs can go away, study, and then come back and tell us what they went through. And we also want to celebrate it by having residents and pop-ups. My goal is to have one night where you maybe have 10 pop-ups around the country where people can go in Los Angeles and San Francisco and New Orleans and New York and having this experience through black food in many different restaurants and share that experience, upload that experience. Uh, and we'll also be a fundraiser for the residence program because black food is America's food and we have to celebrate it and we have to take care of it. And there's never been a more important and doubtful moment actually than this. But I do know that what I look at is some of the black best art we know in black culture comes from very tough times, right? I think about when the moments of the fifties and the sixties you know, out of that comes rock and roll and Motown sounds, right? You know, in the 70s, post Vietnam, you know, we get funk, we get Stevie's best albums, right? Out of Reaganomics and HIV and, and the crack epidemic comes Prince, Sign of the Times, comes hip hop, you know, Public Enemy, Tribe Called Quest. So we've always had when I think about the food, you know, the, the enslaved people gave us the starting point of these four cuisines, the low country, Southern food, barbecue and Creole. So I know we're going in through this horrific time, but out of it, it's gonna come also great stuff, great food, great cooking, great connections. So you've, you've talked a lot about music um, and, and sort of the similarities with the music and food being a fabulous connector and, and bringing us together. Um, I'd like to do something fun with you, Marcus, um, okay? I want you to imagine an orchestra or a band made up of food. So I'm gonna suggest a certain flavor or ingredient and you tell me what instrument or what part of the band it is, mm -hmm. okay? 
Let's start with Barbare. Oh, Barbare is definitely the baseline. You of course it's there. All right, garlic. Uh, I would say garlic is backup singer. Oh, okay. and I'm ta- I'm talking like Earthman and Fire. This is a we're building a band here. Yeah, we're not happy like yeah. Uh, okra. Mm. The horn section. Rice. Oh, drums. Plantains. Also part of the horn section. Baby back ribs. Ooh, now you're moving forward. I mean, I might that might be the keys. Shrimp. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I think the bongas is there. It's rare, right? What about curry? Piano. All right. And what ingredient or uh, or uh, flavor would the vocals be? See, I I think for me, it's more delicate. It's like the seafood, for example, right? You know, that's the delicate. That's the vocal, and you know, I think it's it's right there. Like that's the snapper. Those are the fishes and the seafood. The more delicate stuff. Uh, that was fun. Thanks for doing that, Mark. That was amazing. I loved it. And it's a new exercise. I've never done that. Yeah, I, I did it. I did it with Yota Odolenge. We had a yeah, lot Yota would know. Yeah. So um, um, how much is music an influence to you? I mean, you've talked a lot about it. Uh, do you play music while you're cooking? Do you, are, do you, are you actively involved with what music is playing in the restaurant? I mean, music is everything for me because when I go into create food wise I'm pretty clear what I want to create but when I look at our black experience in the world music has done the best job of documenting its journey and it wasn't easy how we got there right and I look at music both from an African lens but also from an American lens right in African lens, it's tribal. It's based on the rituals, whether it's the drums or whether it, you know, whether it's the blues. But also documentation. If you want to talk about gospel, bebop, jazz, rock and roll, soul, funk, hip hop, trap. It's very layered and it creates clarity for non-Americans and Americans to talk about our culture. Food-wise, I feel like part of my job is to unpack this and make it visible so people will make the right announcement, right? We would never think about the saying, oh, I love my Apple iPhone. It's from Nigeria because they sell it in Nigeria. So we're very clear where Apple comes from. But when it comes to food and black food, we act like that relevance is not important. And it is important because once you allocate brilliance and authorship, you start talking to one another from a different respect level. Right now we're entering the world that great stuff comes from the West and we give aid to the, to the Africa, to the continent, which then shifts even blackness in this country, right? So color, class, money, all of that stuff. So we, if we're gonna, food can be the most delicious way of engaging in culture and race, but we gotta have the right authorship. We gotta create the best memories. So we can create the right, right aspirations. Speaking of some memories, uh, Marcus, in closing, uh, tell us about the state dinner you uh, put together for President Obama's first uh, mm-hmm. uh, first dinner. What was that experience like? Well, it's one of the big, big, biggest privilege of my life and highest honors. First, to be able to work with the First Lady, Michelle Obama, right when she started her incredible garden initiative, right? Uh, state dinners or any dinner should be always thinking about who's your guest of honor? And in this case, there was 
Prime Minister Singh that happened to be vegetarian. So right there we had, we knew that most of the food have to have a vegetarian lens. We could add meat to it, but it started with vegetarian dishes. So just uh, the structure of the menu uh, it was also um, a moment because it was the first day dinner. We knew the importance of that. Um, and I have so many great memories from the fact that after the dinner and they've, you know, think about it. They've been shaking hands of 400 people. The first couple was kind enough to come backstage to the kitchen with us. President Obama and Michelle Obama spoke to all the cooks and the dishwashers and spent a good 30 minutes with us after. I mean, now it's 1130 at night. And I will never, I will always remember that. And that was an act of empathy and kindness because they knew how much this night would mean to me and my crew. And, and yeah, it was it was a, one of the biggest honors in my life. Well, terrific. It has been an honor hosting you again, uh, Marcus. Uh, a reminder again, the book is The Rise, Black Cooks and the Soul of American Food. It is available wherever books are sold. And if you visit the comment section, you can get a copy with a signed book plate.